The Nikki Glaser Podcast. Here's Nikki. Hello, here I am. Welcome to the show. It's the Nikki Glazer Podcast. How are you guys feeling out there today? Hope you're doing well. Thanks for listening to the show. I'm here in St. Louis alone. Brian Frangi is here with us from LA. Noah is in Arizona. What's up, guys? How are you? Yo. I'm starting to Happy. say yo again. I don't know. Yeah? It's bad. What do you think Have about you noticed yo? that you're bringing it back and like against your will? It's one of those yeah. where you're like, why am I saying this so much? I, or like you're co- cog... Co- wait, what? you're doing it on purpose. There's a word I am that cognizant. I am not. Yes, yes, I'm, thank you. It's just coming out of my mouth. Um, I don't <sighs> know, know why. I think it's from like the 90s, and I don't think it's coming back. Yo. No, I, yeah. say, yo, I say yo when I answer the phone every time. Oh, you do? Yeah, pretty much every time. Yo, if it's a friend. Wow. Always yo. I have a different hello for Especially almost everybody. Especially if it's my friend Yo-Yo me. Mom. And then I say, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> well, you have to, pretty much. You have a different thing for every person that calls you? Pe- different people call me, and I give them a hello that's requisite to their personality. Okay. What if it's oh. me? Ring, hello. Ring. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. <laughs> I'm really nervous. I'll be no, right there. Go, go, hello? Uh, for you? No, I, I know Brian think... Frangie's hello. Hello? I do not think... Yeah, maybe that's for you. That's, yeah. your, that's your hello to everyone. No. For some people, really? I go... Um, I go, sup, dude. Wait, what about but oh, Tim Dillon? I bet this guys. I'll go, sup, dude. Really? Yeah. Are, is this real? This is real. This is real. Wait, I've never heard you even do that voice Hello? in my life. I mean, that's just because it's for certain people. For guys. For certain guys. For other guys, I'll go, hey. For like Rob Stern, my really good friend Rob Stern, I'll, yeah. go, I'll go like, hi. Or like, hey. Or like, what? You know, something like really yeah. short. Like, what like it's is- one of those East Coast. I'm, uh, I'm acting like I don't like you on purpose, but that means I'm really, I really like you. Uh huh. That's that classic bit. I have a problem with exiting off the phone. Like, yeah. I just, I, you know, I classically have the Glazer exit, which is a thing my boyfriend coined ten years ago, eleven years ago when we started dating. Where I, if I'm ready to go, I just say it and then I get up and go. I don't need to like talked about this before i don't need to talk i don't need to announce it and then say i'm leaving and like we're gonna go pretty soon i just i just know what i want and then i do it um and Mm. it's enneagram three it's just i don't waste time i don't that is wasting time to me to be like i'm gonna build in this buffer so people are more comfortable with me leaving leaving like that doesn't save anyone time in life it i guess it's courteous but why like why is it so discourteous is that the Antonym of Curtis. Why is it so um, discognizant to say <laughs> that you're going to leave? Like, leaving, I think people have a hard time with goodbyes because, you know, the Irish exit is something to do because you're, mm-hmm. t- y- people say it's because they're, they're tired and they just don't want to go say goodbye to everyone. But really, my th- old therapist, my abusive therapist, uh, Dr. Busev, <laughs> she used to tell me that. Um, I, people are scared of goodbyes, so she would make people go to three sessions to say goodbye to her. If you were like, I'm done seeing you, she'd be like, okay, we have to go do three sessions to say goodbye because everyone's scared of goodbyes and you have to lean into them and actually like, you know, tease them out, which really she was maybe ma- wanting to make more money. But I think that she had somewhat of a point mm-hmm. is that we're scared. I don't like that. I I even was thinking about, I think with, with goodbyes, you start to say even if it's just going saying goodbye for the night, like I'll see you tomorrow, there's some kind of summary and there's some kind of like emotion that has to come out of it of like, it meant so much to me that you came. Oh, it's so good to see. Like, There's too much emotion in it and I want to flee from that. I think that's probably why I don't like goodbyes. It's too like, there's too many feelings involved and, and in it time. really could be the last time you see someone. And also wow. it just takes forever to say goodbye to someone as an Enneagram 9. Yes. <laughs> who feels the need to like... Her. Make sure that everyone's at peace with me leaving the room, which nobody gives a flying fuck. No yeah, isn't that it funny? just takes You're forever. You're cognizant of the fact that no one cares, but it doesn't it to change it. the fact. You so you say goodbye to everyone when you leave a party. Um, well, actually, after meeting you and learning the Glazer exit, which is like the best thing ever, because you've always taught me that nobody cares, no one's gonna remember that you left, especially at the end of the night where everyone's like have socialized if they're yeah. drunk or whatever like they're not thinking about you so just go so that has helped me a and lot but do you if if you're someone that would like to be said goodbye to at a party you're throwing and then like if you found out someone left and they didn't say goodbye if that would offend you then i can see how you might 
want to say goodbye me. to people. But if if you put yourself in the shoes of someone who's hosting party and has to say not only hello to every person that oh, arrives yeah. because they're the host, but then you have to say goodbye to like do your host a solid and say don't say goodbye. Yeah, just bounce. Send a text the next day that they can thumbs up. Less less energy. Yeah, we only have so much energy, and and I do think there is something to goodbyes, and we should lean into them a bit more. And you know, you shouldn't ghost people. You should give them. If you've dated them for a long enough time, you do owe them some kind of explanation. But um, even I was thinking about my birthday party coming up. Like we're, I'm having mm. girls trip in St. Louis. I'm pretty much just doing, uh, you know, with all all the girls that can make it from girls chat converging in St. Louis over my birthday weekend. We're going to do karaoke. And I told Anya this weekend, I was like, I need to announce it on the girls chat. I don't want any speeches about how much you love me. And like, mm-hmm. I don't want any toast to me. I oh, don't want God. any emotion about what I mean to you. I can't handle it. I already know. I really do. Like, I know that my friends love me. I know that my family loves me. Um, I don't, I don't, I really am uncomfortable. And it's just, I should probably allow it because it's nice for people to express themselves and it's something that they want to do. It's not always about me and what I want. Mm-hmm. It's something that people are like, no, I want to give you this compliment or whatever. So do that on their birthday. I just want them to write a card. I'll read it oh, at cards some are point. Nice. A nice or like card. my niece will leave read it when she's cleaning up my stuff when I die someday. <laughs> you know, like someone will read how much you loved me and possibly mm. it will be me, but I don't wanna I don't really like toast and I don't think I'm alone in, in not enjoying um sincere uh moments of like and everyone in my group of girlfriends is pregnant and so I just don't there's gonna be too many tears oh, yeah. that I won't even be able to like accept because I'm like, oh it's just their hormones. This isn't even about me. It's about like a baby inside them. And so then I w I won't even be able to take it personally and and then I will have to meet it. If I don't cry then I'll feel like I don't do it that I don't care enough or something. So I'm just like it's I get I want to just treat it like a normal girls weekend and it's we're not talking about my birthday at all. And it's not because I'm scared I'm turning 40. I don't mind like we can celebrate the number. We can celebrate. We can have signs and candles and cake and everything. But just know like Nikki, like you means I just in besties. I love when you write cards, too, because that's that's where I get all that. And I, I like the meet and greet um, girls that cry and guys yeah. that say how much I mean to them and stuff like that's that. That's their one chance because it's quick yeah. and it has to be quick because there's a line, not because I want it to be quick, but for some reason that doesn't, I, I, they're strangers to me, you know, just because I have never usually seen them before. So I don't think I'm required as much except to just like listen and accept it. And I just you don't can't have to reciprocate I just, really. I don't know why I can't handle it. I just have been like dreading birthday speeches, but they don't have to happen. Right. Noah, like everyone can not do one. Of course not. It's you your birthday. Songs, as long as, we can sing happy birthday to you. And by we, I'll be there in spirit because I won't be able to be there. But. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because you're in third trimester. Um, mm. Okay, so yeah, you won't be there. So you won't. So you and you wouldn't you wouldn't do it anyway because you're not a very like ting, ting, ting. Everyone listen to me kind of person. Right. Not that yeah. the other girls are it the making card. it about them or something. But yes, they can sing happy birthday, even though that's excruciating as well. And we can all agree that. That's what about all. at your funeral? Would you want people to say nice things about you? Yeah, there? I'm not there. Yes. Oh, absolutely. That's where. That's when. She, that's when she wants it. Yeah. yeah, I'll be there watching from you, some. If you're a ghost and you're watching, you would be happy that people are saying nice things about yeah, you. Yeah, and if I don't like it, I can just duck out and go hang out with. Duck out. Go hang out with Van Gogh. Or... Brittany Murphy. <laughs> yeah. Van Gogh and Brittany Murphy. Um, no. Yeah, I just feel like, yes, funeral is where I want to be appreciated and um, all those things. But I, it's so funny because I don't, I don't know why I want other people to hear how great I am, but I don't want, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> mm. Is that, why is that? You're unwilling to accept anything positive because that's because how you feel about yourself. Exactly. Because I don't really believe it. And it, feel like, yeah. it feels like I'm just like, you're pouring water onto a rock when you yeah. give me compliments yes but it, other people rock. are grass and if and they can absorb the things that about me much easier and and believe that they're true than i can and so it just feels yeah. like yeah crying on a rock um there was a on an early date i had with ali we went to the gene autry museum which is a west a museum of the west in los angeles and mm-hmm. they had a exhibit there that was like a little rock garden and mm-hmm. one of the things that they let you do was take a little bit of water and brush the rock, which I thought was so stupid. 
<laughs> it was just like it's come so here to the museums museum museums and wet exhibit. the rock. Oh, it's so bad. Yeah, I couldn't stop laughing. It was like the it was like the only time in my entire life I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> but that happens at museums all the time or like i went to the aquarium with my niece and nephew last week and there's just so much stupid stuff that you're just like yeah. they just needed to do, have something for someone to yes. do here the there rock. is a this isn't stupid because it's actually kind of cool but it is annoying you put your hand in, it's like those uh japanese foot spas where the fish eat your cuticles oh yeah yeah and you that's a that's a station at the st louis aquarium oh that's cool um, no, it's not. No Love one it. needs that. First of all, they starve the fish <laughs> in order for thing. them to do it. Oh, God. The, the fish are uh, not fed properly, so they're starving. Why do you think they attack your fucking, like, they start gnawing on any extremity that goes in is because they're so hungry. They only so, eat the cuticle? Same with, same with Japanese food. Like, the dead skin and the salt and whatever is, like the dirt on your fingers, on your hands. Wow. They, like, love eating it because they're hungry. But guess what? That is not only inhumane to deprive them of actual food and to feed them human skin but human skin is not their food like that's not what they eat in the wild it's like right. we're just having these kids put in their hands and these it, and it's so gross oh, the, the way it feels on your kids hands is, makes it worse oh it's so disgusting kids hands are covered in sticky fruit fruit roll up oh yeah it's a fucking boogers. buffet they yeah. love oh those fish are so lucky to get that but they're not because they actually should be eating no. actual fish food and not human so it was a yeah. weird part to have in this exhibit it just felt like it felt like it was a um pita should have been up in there there and is a PETA, skill PETA hates japanese uh foot there spots. is a Don't skill go to those, of having um uh, to being a good curator of a museum and sometimes museums yeah. are really stupid and bad and sometimes they're good like There's there are some- parts of the holocaust museum that i liked or the Holocaust exhibit that I liked. Mm-hmm. But the there are we parts that were stupid. Over the yeah, we went, mm-hmm. Yes, that's right. We went to it together. We did, we did a deep dive. And, the, you, and at the Holocaust Museum, you can't be skipping a part, even though you go, this is lame. And mm-hmm. this is for babies. And it's for people. Right. It's just, you know, there were some cool things. Let me just they talk about the They have sensory cool activities for kids at the Holocaust Museum. <laughs> yeah, you can stick your hand in a gas chamber and watch yeah, you the can gas build a pile of cuticles. shoes. Um... <laughs> Oh, God. It was brutal. Um, I do recommend going to that one. I don't think it's open anymore, though, right? Yeah, you cool. said That's it was why limited. we went. That's why yeah, we went. Yeah, it was it's like the last weekend. Big billboards. Uh, big billboards going across the uh, 405 all mm-hmm. summer long just said Auschwitz ending yeah. May 29th or whatever. Oh, my God. And that's when I knew I got to go. It, yeah. was, it was really moving. Ending and for, for now. The, yeah. Except for the Who guards. That's what happens in November. Um, yeah. Uh, the guards? Yeah, I remember the guards were like, move it along, people, when we were in the <laughs> yeah, train. They turned into Auschwitz guards. They turned into Auschwitz guards. Yeah. That's a great episode um, of the Nikki Glazer podcast. You should listen to it. Go into the archives. Yeah, go back and listen to our trip one. through the Auschwitz Museum. Yeah. Um, know that the aquarium also had a lot of touching things, which kids love to touch things. And CNN if I was a kid, I would love to touch jellyfish cool. yeah. and oh. stingrays. Oh, yeah. But I'm so sorry. These animals, it's they're trapped in this, like, a huge depressed. aquarium. I can't. It's go a big to box. It's so. Zoos. It's so depressing. Zoos yeah. and aquariums are fucking depressing, dude. I can't even believe people aren't there's, talking about there's it. There's only one. So, um, in Arizona, there's one. It's called Out of Africa, and I just want to say it's more of an animal sanctuary because the it's a privately run sanctuary, and all mm-hmm. all the animals there are saved by the owners. So basically, they have this like huge playground of animals that they get to save and play with, and then. The, the ticket sales help keep that place running. Yeah. I don't think Uh-oh. these otters were saved. <laughs> I don't think they're being rehabilitated. I think they were bred in captivity or stolen from the wild, which is how a lot of zoos populate their things is they're stolen from the wild, dude. Like, uh, I just watched David Tell's special and he goes, I went to SeaWorld, or as I call it, Aquatic Auschwitz. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's really sad. Well, you know what's sad. worse than, than the aquarium for these fish is the ocean. I mean, the ocean, you're just constantly being attacked and eaten. Can you imagine, though, these fucking jellyfish are, con- you can't touch them below. You're supposed to, like, touch them with the two finger touch mm-hmm. on top, just graze them gently, which, how many kids abide by that? Half, yeah. maybe? And then uh, the others are just palming these things. And there's, like, a person who's been working there for eight hours watching yeah. over it. So they're not catching everyone two who's fingers. manhandling these. Yeah. But they're, they're so tired of being there. And the jellyfish flip over. 
all of them are flipped over and I go, I wonder why. Because they don't want to fucking be touched anymore. Because you can't touch them yeah. when they're flipped over. So I go, interesting that all of these jellyfish are flipping over. All of mm-hmm. them. Because they have been being touched. They're touched for 16 hours a day. However long, it, how 12 hours a day, these things are just being poked at by kids. Yeah. It's like what, the kids that on, on the set of Nickelodeon. Oh, my oh God. I didn't watch that yet. Oh, I gotta watch Those that. Those only got touched when the, the cameras went off. Uh, mm. That is so disturbing. I, I oh. cried last night, and I rarely cry. I, I, I take in a lot of brutal things, and I rarely get like emotional and so angry watching something, but Quiet on Set on Max God. is so good and mm. um, is all about Dan Schneider, this producer of Nickelodeon shows that was like, you know, the Chuck... Lori of Nickelodeon pretty much like just hit maker for TV shows um, in the 2000s and he's a fucking creep always having women massage him on set constantly Oh God. Um, making two women who worked for him uh, take one man's salary split a salary split a Jesus salary Christ um, because they were women uh, just always making them do sexual things just making disgusting jokes just this it was it's just that's horrifying and you watch a couple episodes of that shit going down and then him being kind of inappropriate with um on the shows just do like doing you know cum shots pretty much for jokes no where a girl will get sp- sp- you know squirted with goo in her face zoom in on their feet zoom in on them sucking things there's always jokes what? about sausages hitting what shows in the face. Are, are these zoe 101 all that um making there's a guy called pickle boy that I remember from all that. Oh, I wasn't Pickle watching Boy. all that at the time, but Pickle Boy was this guy that would always show up with a huge thing of pickles, and he was oh. like uh, ever present on all that throughout the 2000s. Turns out he was a massive pedophile, massive. Wow. And uh, his massive. victim, he he eventually got caught because his victim was Drake Bell from Drake and Josh. And oh, I thought, I thought it was Drake. Could Degrassi. have been him too. I mean, he was on Degrassi. As, he was probably a kid during then. But Drake uh, Bell from Drake, Drake and Bell. Josh, which was a humongously popular show prior to that. To Lake Bell. Stop making jokes. We're talking about child molestation. <laughs> he hasn't watched it. I haven't. Well, I don't know. What you we're can't. Talking about. Like, I literally can't make jokes about it because I'm <laughs> so incensed about it. This guy d- just tricked the, Drake Bell had an amazing father who would be on set watching closely making sure that nothing was happening um that was inappropriate and then he started seeing this guy just paying way too much to Pickle Boy the guy who played Pickle Boy named Brian Peck not to be confused with Josh Peck who was played Josh on Drake and or in Josh or Drake and yeah um Brian Peck Pickle Boy would just touch him too much help him with wardrobe where he's like he doesn't need your help putting that on and the dad Alerted other parents, started talking about it. Like, have you noticed this? All the parents were just like, no, it's fine. Then he went to, I think he went to the heads. Did you watch it, Noah? He went like. I saw the first episode. Oh, God. The the third is where it gets so fucking mm. grisly with this with Drake Bell talking about it for the first time. It's so sad. This 15-year-old kid gets preyed upon by this guy and there's nothing he can do about it. He doesn't have a license. He can't leave the house that it's happening in. This guy by this time is like his best friend, a 40 year old man who's inserted himself in his life, who's made him turn against his father. I mean, these pedophiles are so fucking, there's also um, Amanda Bynes. Yeah. And her relationship with Dan Snyder. It's like, Oh yeah, that was gross. And we don't really get details of what happens because she's not talking and he certainly isn't. But he is just disgusting, dude. I can't even anyone. He literally said they have footage of him saying, you know, the cast all comes out and he's talking to the studio audience before taping. And he's like, after the show, you can meet the cast. You can touch them any way you want. You can ask them questions. You can ask them any inappropriate question you want. Really get personal. Make them feel awkward. Like and he loved doing this thing on all that where he would make the kids do this. Like it's called like a live dare or something i forget what it's called but all the kids that are cast members come back and talk about it and they're like this that the live the uh, the live dares were the worst part of the show because he would make kids do fear factor stuff and they couldn't say no they're not adults and any any saying no on set um would just make it so that you wouldn't get put on sketches and he also he also did an interview where he says i love that these kids sometimes these kids try to razz me and they get a little attitude and i go i am right the show if you want to do that, I'll write you doing something really bad next week. He said that. Oh, like it's on it's 
so insane that this is allowed to happen, but because it's allowed to happen because he made hits. Nickelodeon get, didn't give a fuck. And yeah. no one from Nickelodeon ever reached out to Drake Bell after he went to, took uh, this guy to court and had him ar- arrested. And he went late. This guy who got arrested and is a child sex offender registered went on to work on other sets with children on the Disney Channel. Oh my God. Hollywood is disgusting. Keep yeah. your kids the fuck out of there. I'm serious. Like, it's either they're getting fucked by the people making the shows or they're not getting roles. Like, some mm. of these kids were like, oh, you know, I was the favorite until Amanda came along and then she got all the attention. And then it quickly zooms into like Amanda becoming probably of slightly a victim of some inappropriate behavior we're not sure of dan Snyder's, but it was really like oh i stopped getting i I stopped getting like good parts because he wanted to molest someone else yeah or like whatever it was like that's the vibe like if you're a child actor who's working and getting a lot of work it's because people some man wants to fuck you it's disgusting keep your kids out of it let them decide to get into it when they're adults and they can ruin their lives on their own because it will, it is a life ruiner. It's not a good business. Brian, would you let your kids be in Hollywood if they wanted to? How would you handle it? Because I kind of think if I, I might. had kids, <laughs> even though I just said that. Because <laughs> I think I'd be vigilant. I wouldn't let shit go down. I think it's different nowadays than it was back in the nineties. I think um, or two thousand eleven. Are... I mean, this wasn't the even then. Back. I mean, I think things have changed, and hopefully that change sustains. If my kid came up to me and said, "I want to be an actor," then yeah, I would. Uh, allow them to i would i would help them pursue it for sure but they'd have to say i want i don't want to be one of those parents who is like you've got to be a star you've got to go out there you if you're not in sesame street by six then you're nothing to me but the thing is kids don't if you like to act it doesn't mean you'll like hollywood you know what i'm saying like it's a different thing but i i don't know let's talk about it more when we get back from break all right we're back i do think that if i had a talented child that that loved performing i would let them do that but um that you would mean i would experience. have to give up my life watching them on set you just have and, to be and, on and set all the time you have experience like on actual sets so you know how it kind of works and i feel like you would probably vi- be vigilant of this stuff but the truth is like if so many of these parents that were like hey my kids let's just not even talk about sexual abuse my kid is working too long of hours my kid shouldn't be in this leotard because you can see his penis through it and he's f- forced to be in this penis costume all the time with penis these things on his shoulder that are supposed to be noses but they look like penises because every these fucking sick fucks remember what was happening with disney remember when like disney there would be hidden like penises on the little mermaid castle and in the the clouds on the lion king it said sex they love to like these sick fucks if you're talented at making children's entertainment dan snyder who prides himself on like i know how kids think why do you know how kids think that's Mm. gross Stop and stop saying that. People shouldn't. People should maybe study psych, child psychology and have some sort of, uh, like be like I'm an adult who has learned what children like, but don't admit that you know somehow because that's weird. I don't know. I just don't like. I don't like it at all, at all. And I think, um, yeah, the the if you're a parent that notices those things, even me, I would feel like if my daughter was on a, a sketch show on Nickelodeon. And because I said, hey, she's working too long of hours, then she doesn't get in the next the show the next day or the next the next episode. She gets cut from a lot of stuff because she needs to work less and all the other kids are working way harder. Like I would, and she would probably be mad at me. I know I would be mad at my mom. Like, just shut up, mom, let me work. Like I, I don't know that I'd be strong enough to put my yeah. foot down like that if all the other parents who are so desperate for their kids to be famous put up with so many abuses happening. And this isn't all the parents. A lot of the parents on the, sh- the show are good. That's the problem is like it's just a tricky business and it's all about power. And if you have power in the business and you're making these businesses money, they don't care what you do. It's just that's the way it is. The Me Too movement is the reason Dan Snyder ever got fired is because suddenly – these women who had watched him getting demanding massages from these wardrobe from the w- women in the wardrobe department who were outfitting three shows with tons of kids so busy they would yeah. get texts from him being like come downstairs and massage me and she's like if she doesn't do it she'll get fired it won't be about that but that will be the result of it so she has to go massage this guy they were putting up with it for years there was not a day or she was like usually it was daily but there was not a week that went by that she, he wasn't being massaged by some woman that jo- whose job it was not to massage him and they 
for years until 2017, 18, when Me Too happened. And then they all got the balls to go, actually, this isn't cool. And what a cool movement. I know everyone like jokes about it, but that really was like such a turning point. People just suddenly had the the guts to stand up and like call stuff out. And it's still stuff is still happening all the time. I mean, the Diddy thing is insane. Diddy's mm. on a jet right now oh to an island God. where he can't be arrested. Like he, he had a plan to get out of the country as soon as they caught him for trafficking charges, I think. And someone made the point that by the time your home is raided by the feds, they have a lot of evidence on you. That's not just like, we're just going to see what's in there. That's like, we know what's in there. Yeah. Diddy has been around for decades. Do you think he just started doing this stuff in the past couple of years? No. no. It's, it's crazy. It's not just Hollywood. It's all businesses, all no, corporations, all yeah. power, politicians, Epstein Island. It's all it's all a part of any power structure, it feels like. How, though, if you or one to, power structure? Yeah, yeah, or one at the top. But how, it's just such a weird thing if you're into little kids. How'd they how get so you, powerful? How do you bring that up with someone and see if they are, too? Like, how do you even... I don't even want to, I'm just floating oh, that as God. like, how do these people find each other? That is Because it, it is like, it is the most insane thing. And by yeah. the way, if you want to fuck kids, I'm not mad at you because you didn't choose to want to fuck kids, but you got to get help for it so that you don't, you know? Like, I'm mad at you if you fuck kids and you touch them and you abuse kids. But if you want to, you can't help that. And that is a sickness in your brain that you need to treat and make sure that you don't touch kids. So it's not a, it's not a bad thing to be attracted to kids because that is a some a disorder in your brain that you didn't choose but you got to do something about it and it but isn't connecting with stuff, other pedophiles. i think you're like in the right line when you're seeing it's like a power thing i think it's more about that than like kid attraction it's just like a oh yeah just doing pushing. like the weirdest thing and like the most fucked up thing and like we can yeah, get away like, with this oh, because i have of- the power because he also did it to the grown women in the writer's room i mean you know like all the stories yeah. that they tell so i, no, I think that it's guy more might of a, not be a pedophile but the the guy he's there's sick. definitely he's sick. i don't i do know that people that watch child porn a lot of them based on this podcast i listened to from sam harris and i've said this a million times a big percentage of people who watch child pornography and trade it and consume it um are not pedophiles they're not attracted to children it's just where porn ends if you follow porn to its conclusion of brutality and extremity, it ends with kids. So those are people on like that have a porn addiction that just went too far, if that makes sense. Mm. So it's not always about being attracted to kids. Sometimes it's just because you're so fucking sick. That's like you 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 need the next sick thing, and that's where Can it ends. You talk it's, about it's, fun Hollywood. Yeah, what's going on in fun Hollywood? Is there uh, fun Hollywood? your weekend? Oh, yeah. That was a fun weekend, fun Hollywood, Hollywood weekend. <laughs> um, I went to um, the Mark Twain Prize on Sunday night after our oh. shows. We did shows this weekend in Gary, Indiana on Friday. Saturday, we were in Cincinnati. Those were so fun. Brian was there. We'll talk about those. But, yeah, Sunday night, I went to the Mark Twain Prize in D.C., uh, which my this boyfriend, was your Chris, second one. produces. Yes, it was my second in a row. And it was... So star studded. It was so funny. It'll air on in May. I don't want to say the date because it kind of coincides with another date that's coming up. That's a bigger deal for me. So Mm. watch it eventually, but don't watch it premiere night because I think something else premiere night is happening. That is um, just the same day. Yeah. Oh, get out of here. What a coincidence. Oh, my God. I said, oh, Chris Convey producing two things. The two things you produce in a year, both airing the same night. Jesus. Um, So anyway, Watch the other thing that's coming out that date, but I'm not going to say the date yet because I can't announce anything. But anyway, um, it was Jerry Seinfeld. It was Chris Rock. It was Dave Chappelle. It was Chelsea Handler. It was Jimmy Fallon. It was Lil Dicky. It was um, Robin Thicke. It was Nelly. Oh, man. Um, uh, Nick Cannon. And I don't know who else. I, I, it was just so many. And, and obviously Kevin Hart. They were honoring Kevin Hart. And it was um, so star-studded. And it was incredible. And but so funny. And Keith Robinson. The Rock was not there. But you didn't miss him. Yeah. I I gotta be honest. What Guys, what's your favorite Kevin Hart movie? Um, uh, I don't even. I couldn't even tell you. I don't even have ever seen yeah. one. Okay, well, let's talk about this because that is a question that got asked Jumanji? to me on the red carpet. And 
I realize I have never seen a Kevin Hart movie. Yeah, I just know. I just like You're his like, and people him go, being why couldn't you just name one? Zeitgeist. And I go, well, so I should say a movie I've not seen and lie on the red carpet yeah. because it's just to be nice and just say whatever movie I can think of. Um, I didn't want to do that. Like I, they, they, I didn't. I planned for the red carpet. Here's my things I'm going to say about Kevin Hart. Here's what I admire about him. I did not think that they would ask me for a specific movie. What's your favorite Kevin Hart movie? And I literally froze and was like, uh, and I'm really trying to think of a favorite one, you know, like, okay, let me think of the ones I've seen and then let me pick the favorite. But it looks like I'm just like, should I lie? And and there was a part of me that was like, should I lie? And then I was like, I don't even know if I could because I can't even come up with a name of a movie because I don't really watch movies that much. I don't know if you've noticed. I, I, I watched the Oscar Best Pictures this year, but that was the most movies I've ever seen in my life in a, in mm-hmm. a time period since eighth grade. I just I would definitely have seen a Kevin Hart movie if he was around in 1998 to 2002. But I, I don't watch movies anymore. Um, right. And they and I literally I just go, ah, uh, and there's literally three microphones in my face four video cameras pointing at me and I'm like oh my god this is going to be so embarrassing like this is going to end up on Reddit this girl is on the red carpet pretending to be a huge Kevin Hart fan which I wasn't by the way and I I am a huge Kevin Hart fan in my own way but I wasn't pretending to be I was like I just go I'm here because my boyfriend produces this okay I'm not trying to be anything I'm not I've never seen a Kevin Hart movie I think I'm realizing I've never seen a Kevin Hart movie and they all laughed and I go I I don't like it was almost like a gotcha moment and um and I felt so I started having a panic attack because I was like, this is going to be so embarrassing. I look like a dumb white girl who like doesn't like I, I don't know. I just felt like it was like, a, I don't know. I was just in my head about it. And so I don't know if you've ever been on a red carpet. No, but if you <laughs> but if you it's already so much pressure. I already was feeling not that cute. Like my hair extensions were too blunt. And so it was like my hair was like natural. And then there were like these chunky blunt extensions that were just mm-hmm. poorly cut. And I looked I it looked like I um remember John Travolta in that movie where he has like tendrils coming out of his head. He's like a action star. It almost looked like uh, dreadlocks and battlefield in. earth. Yes. That's oh, yeah, what that, I looked like. That's a Scientology like. movie. Really? Yeah, that movie oh. was like Scientology propaganda. Oh my god! But then they go. Well, before that happened, I was interviewed by a comedian who I know, Reese Waters, and he goes, "What's your favorite Kevin Hart bit?" Mm-hmm. And I blanked again. Ah. And I, I don't know. I've seen Kevin Hart stand up a lot, but mm-hmm. I don't remember bits. I, I just yeah, watched Dave's, Dave David Tell's special, and I couldn't tell you. Well, I can tell you maybe one joke, and I would I butcher the Auschwitz one. I kind of butchered it. I'm not, uh-huh. and I, I don't know a Kevin Hart bit. And so I go, Reese, I go, um, I don't. And then I felt like he thought I'd never seen Kevin Hart stand up or something or that I was, I don't know. It just felt, I go, Reese, as a comedian, you know, we see, first of all, we don't like watching stand up comedy. I don't like watching comedy. And I certainly don't like watching Kevin Hart, who is like, uh, seems so, he's too good. You know, like he's too natural and good of a storyteller and like it just comes too naturally to him and it bothers me. Uh-huh. So I don't I really don't like to watch people who I think are are talented in ways that I'm not. I'm not drawn to that. Um and so I already was stressed out about answering that and saying I and not being able to come up with the Kevin Hart bit that I loved. And then I go a couple more interviews later and I'm coming down from that. So that's in the back of my head like, "Oh my god, you're such an idiot. That's going to come out. You're going to look like such a fraud." All the uh, total I just want to say sweating. This is, this is hyperventilating. Like the most extensive questioning on a red carpet <laughs> that I've seen. Usually they ask like silly questions. Like I was furious, Noah. I there was I had no publicist there because I just didn't. And so you were just you are on the red carpet by yourself. Usually, if you watch red carpet footage, there's someone like ushering someone through, and they go, "Sorry, she can't talk." There's someone else telling the person for them, and I'm usually down to talk to everyone, but I was. I hadn't eaten enough that day, so I was feeling low blood sugar. I had rushed to get ready. I was coming from hair and makeup that I was uh, feel the hair part. I was just my extensions were good. The rest was amazing, but I was just feeling blotchy with my spray tan. My dress was Zara, and it like didn't fit properly. I just felt like not put together in the way mm. I wanted, and so I was feeling stressed out. I did the pictures, and that was stressful enough because I just was like didn't know what poses to do. I was just not in a good headspace at this thing. I was tired and I was underfed and. Then the question started, and I'm not kidding you, I did 15 interviews, 15. There was a Jeez. microphone after wow. microphone after microphone, and you talked to each person for three three minutes at least. And then, so 
I am a, the first interview I did. I couldn't come up with a bit of his, and I feel like an idiot. I feel like a fraud. I feel like um, just uh, the, my mind goes to you're going to get canceled because this seems like you are like lying about liking someone that you're here to support, and this is a night to honor him. And you are just you you got caught I'm trying to compare it to like a, a moment where someone gets caught being fake, but I just felt busted. Like oh, you're not a real Kevin Hart fan because. I don't know. It's he was he's I I like him okay. Mm-hmm. You know I think he's I think he deserves this award. Do I have to be a fan of every fucking thing? And so and everyone's talking you, about uh, him like he's Obama. You know like he changed right. the world. And every interview is like, why does he deserve this? Why has he been such an influence to you? And I'm like, he hasn't been. No. I mean he ha- he has in terms of his work ethic. And so I, I I was able to summon why I really love Kevin Hart. And you can listen to those interviews because. Um, I figured out a, a line of logic that worked for me after failing so much. But then I get to the one where they go, what's your f- favorite Kevin Hart movie? And I blanked and there's all these cameras looking at me and I rarely can't don't say anything. And I then jump to right to defensiveness because I see that they're all like, you don't even know a Kevin Hart movie. Oh mm-hmm. my God, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm not going to lie. I've never se- I don't think I've ever seen one. And then I'm like, but I don't really watch movies. I forget what I said. I was like, I don't need to defend this. I'm allowed to be here and to have not seen a Kevin Hart movie. <laughs> I didn't say all this, but I was. Right? right? Like, is, is it a crime to not have seen a Kevin Hart movie? I don't no. think so. This I, is, okay. I, I, someone, yeah. Chris was telling me all the Kevin Hart movies, and I go, I don't, I don't really care about seeing any of those. I don't feel like I... I'm sad that I've never seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. I'm sad that I've never seen Wedding Crashers. I should see The Godfather. I should see The Godfather Part 2. I know there are certain movies that I should see. Get Hard. I don't think I need... I, that's like I need to see it. Or do you Okay, uh, let's play a game. It's, call, it's, it's called, is this a Kevin Hart movie or is this a random word generator title? Okay. Okay, you ready? I love it. Here's the first one. Um, still pavement. Well, that's random. Okay, that is random. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another one. Um, the ghost writer. Random. That's correct. That is random. All right. <laughs> Here's another one. Um, uh, Night delete school. Me. Night School is Kevin Hart. Okay, now I know, but this is not going to be, <laughs> delete me is random. The, the reason I okay. know these now is because I went through a whole night of celebrating Kevin Hart, so I am very familiar uh, okay. with his filmography okay. at this point. Are you, is, what about The Man from Toronto? D- random. Real. That is a Kevin Hart movie. What? From 2022. <laughs> That's right. It is a Kevin Hart movie. I should have just said any fucking thing. And they would have believed it. I'd be like, it's this obscure thing he did. <laughs> Try to make one It was one an up. indie project he did in 2017. Um, no, I can't do that. You know I'm not going to do that. Me Time. Me Time? Was that yep. one? No, that's, that sounds like it was. That, but is, that is a Kevin I'm having Hart movie. Ex- I'm having a response again to this. I'm getting like hives and I feel like my throat closing because I seriously couldn't handle how I answered. And then I... You know, like when you trip or fall or something and then you get angry uh, instead of like because you're so embarrassed. So I was so embarrassed yeah. that I was like so fucking mad that these people tried to that asked me that question. And it's a normal question. I mean, he's done a lot of movies. It, it, they weren't trying to get me. But the question They're, should have been, um, you know, if, if Kevin sees this interview, what do you want to tell him? Or like, what's your favorite yeah. thing about Kevin? Would have been you know? nice to keep it broad because I actually yeah. had really interesting things to say about Kevin. I was the only one that was talking about his plant-based burger chain that I fucking love because he's making fast food for plant-based people, which is ah. really fucking cool. What's it called? Heart House. There are four locations now in the Southern California area. More to wow. come. Um, oh. uh, he also, I just, I, I had a lot of stories to tell about him. He was really nice to me when I did his celeb game face show and he was really nice to my mom oh, yeah. and I had a story about that and everything. Mm-hmm. Like I had moments to talk about, but I kept getting these specific questions. And okay, so then I am, I've never felt, I haven't felt this level of panic you were and I'm going to faint because I'm so upset and I want to cry oh and God. I want to faint uh, because I, I chugged a, a Coke before. I never, I only drink Diet Coke. I've literally never had a Coke since I was five years, you know, fifth grade. And I chugged a Coke right before I went on the red carpet because I was already feeling so out of it and like low blood sugar faint. And then that happened and I was about to pass out on the red carpet. I'm not kidding you. And then 
I, so I get done with the, there's a whole row of people with video cameras and microphones, all the press. There was so much press here. It was like the fucking Oscars. It was insane. Wow. I've never done this much press for anything. And I had no publicist to be like, hey, she only can do a couple. Like, oh, just, oh, just every single person just next down the line. And they, they're not even going to use it. You know, like I'm the least famous person there. And so after we get done with all the, after I get done with all the interviews with the camera pe- people with cameras, there's a line of people that with just, you know, handheld recorders that are just reporters for publications. And that was just, there was like a, a cleave in the line of people, right? There was like a little space between them. And I, because before then it had been like one microphone and then you just, you turn to maybe go away or go, you know, skip someone and there's another microphone in your face. You can't, you have no moment to go, hey, can I not do this? So I'm just like stuck. I felt like I was stuck in a, uh, in a river, uh, like a rapids mm. and I'm just hitting different rocks. And then oh now I'm gosh. feeling like I'm going to pass out puke and faint all at once because I'm so Damn. embarrassed. And I'm just thinking my career's over because I just got outed as lying about liking Kevin Hart when I really don't, when I really actually do. And I felt like they're going to make fun of me. And I don't know. I was just really going to some dark places all while trying to look beautiful and suck in and be really eloquent and funny. And then, mm-hmm. and with no help, no one next to me, no one getting me out of this, no, no assistance, no one r- running the red carpet to even look to. And it's a really well run event, but this was a fucking blind spot. And, and next year, if I do this, I will not, uh, I will have someone with me, even if they're pretending to be my publicist, which is all you really need to do. You just need yeah. to have someone. Yes, thank you, Noah. Please, please be there for that. So <laughs> there's a little space, and I go, I said to the next reporter who was holding a recorder, I just go, hey, I, I can't do anymore. I'm so sorry. I just do not feel well. And they go, oh, okay. So when the camera's not on, you don't want to partake. When, oh, for the newspapers, oh, God, you don't it's care. Worse. No. For print journalism, you think, oh, who gives a fuck? And it's like, Jesus. oh, so now you're making, they didn't all say that, but there was this overall groan. And I understand they're at the end of the line and they probably do get passed over by people who are just like, if it's not on camera, I don't care. Yeah. Because it's, you know, Baggage. print journalism's going away. And I feel like they, they already feel, you know, disenfranchised. So it looked like I was just saying, if my face, isn't involved i don't want to be in part of it so they kind of go like oh come on i go no it, it's not it's not that it's because i i don't feel good and i have anxiety right now and i'm like literally starting to almost start to cry and i go and they go well you could just answer a couple and we'll all record at the same time and i was like okay good so then they did that and i answered some questions uh, about to cry like yeah. uh, on the verge of tears oh. like it is What's literally Kevin you know Hart's when your cry rate? is right here <laughs> i would have been better at answering that that could have been a number of, that number like 7 pounds could have been the name of a show he did or a movie yeah. he did so you know when your cry is right here yeah like and you the gobbler if, at, like what is that I hate not having control over my body. That's why I don't like orgasms. That's why I don't like going on roller coasters. I like. I, that's why I don't like watching scary movies. I don't like. I don't like being like a, any jump scare. I want control, and I was losing control. Mm-hmm. And also, Curran, Chris's brother, is watching me. He's behind the reporters, so I see him watching me, and and I see him see the moment where I go, um, um. Like searching for a Kevin Hart movie in my head, but actually one that I've seen and I can't come up and I see him kind of look like, oh no. And he looks scared for me. So I'm just like, it's all of this oh, pressure. No. And, and he's then, not in Hollywood. He doesn't. Yeah. He's just he like, wow, she looks guy. like she's struggling. And then, yeah. so I get done with the interviews with the, the publications and I just, and then I, I walk away and I'm about ready to burst into tears like i am i'm like i can't great now i can't even enjoy this fucking show because i'm gonna be in my head the whole time being like what did i say why did i say that why am i such a failure why did i why am i even here like i should have never done the red carpet like uh, this is embarrassing like i'm not a huge kevin hart fan why am i pretending to be one and i was like freaking out and i'm only sharing this because i think people can relate and i just want people to know that like it is all a act a lot of times for people to seem entertaining and like confident because even though you probably know that from this podcast that I'm not all of those things but that's ended up what I said to the print journalist people I go you want to know why I love Kevin Hart because he is I I admire his confidence and that sounds like a dig because it sounds like you're just saying someone's not talented they're just confident or something I'm Mm -hmm. like no he's already has talent but 
No one believes in Kevin Hart more than Kevin Hart. And he's a testament to if you love yourself enough, what yeah. you can yeah. do. If you don't mm-hmm. question totally. yourself, if you really love yourself and you are never going to abandon yourself and you're always going to be there for yourself, no matter how much you fuck up, uh, Kevin Hart has his own back, you know? Yeah. And, um, and That's I one said, of his movies, actually. <laughs> have your own, own back. back. Yeah. <laughs> his own back. Have your own back. <laughs> he, um, so they're like nodding along, like, yes, girl, yes. And I'm like finally sticking the landing for yeah, my fucking yeah. talking point. And I go, I am not a confident person. I'm not feeling, co- I was like, I, as someone who really struggles with my confidence, and I know that looking at me, it seems like I am. And, but you, if you talk to my girlfriends, you would all, they would all say that I'm probably the least confident of all of them. And mm. I know that's shocking, but most comedians are not confident. And the ones that are most successful are the ones that figure out a way to fucking like themselves. Those are the ones that their talent matches their amount that they believe in themselves. And I really struggle with that. And that's what I admire in, in him. And they go, thank you. Okay. And then they put the, you know, onto the next person. And then I stepped off and I was about to go cry. And then I, t- I saw Curran and he was like, what happened? Because he was a little bit worried, but he was like, oh, it'll be fine. And then I go, I need to go talk to them. So I went back to the print journals and I, I said, and they weren't recording me. I go, hey guys, I just want to let you know, I totally w- was not trying to pass you over because I don't admire what you do or like for any other reason than the fact that I was on the verge of a panic attack uh, because of some questions that get, got asked before that I fucked up. So it had nothing to do with you guys. I just want to let you know, I love you. Thank you. And good night. <laughs> then I walked off and I felt good about that. But then I was like still panicking about my answer to like not knowing his movies. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I was talking to I went to go talk to. So I haven't seen Chris in like two or three weeks. Right. And I'm yeah. seeing him for the first time. And he is about to produce this live show. So he's taking a minute from his night before it begins to go say hi to me and Curran. And I'm like. I fucking, I was like, babe, I know you're busy. I was like, I just have to say, I'm just, uh, I, I, can you just like make me feel calm about what just happened? And I was, I told him what happened. He goes, oh, they won't use it. And I go, wait, why wouldn't they use that? It's so funny that I didn't know any Kevin Hart movies and I'm at a Kevin Hart award ceremony. Uh And he was like, because they only want to make Kevin Hart look good. And I was like, oh, and then he walked away and I was, I just all of a sudden relaxed in my whole body. And Kern was like, Kern had been talking me off the ledge for an hour prior to that, right? Before we got to see Chris. And Kern goes, why couldn't I do what Chris just gave to you? And I was like, dude, you did did so well. You said everything you possibly could. But I forgot that aspect of it, that um, Hollywood is a star maker machine, right? Everything Mm -hmm. is going towards making celebrities look perfect. And they aren't really the ones that ever try to embarrass celebrities. Like some of that happens, but it's usually when they've already picked a victim where we're like, this person's to be made fun of and we're always going to find things to make fun of them. Even TMZ is uplifting celebrities. They're only making fun of the ones we've all decided we should trash them now. So uh-huh. no one's like trying to generate new celebrities to trash or make fun of. Certainly you know, not unless Kevin the- Hart. Right. Or me. You know, like no one's mm-hmm. trying to have a getcha moment with me. And I'm coming from this place of like, I, I'm on Reddit so much, and so I see all of these gaffes of certain celebrities, and I'm picturing myself becoming one of them, and I was like, oh, that's right. Like, everyone, press, it's like the royal, you know, like the royal family and the British press are, like, in bed together, even though they seem at odds because the press comes after them. They really work together to build up the royal family, and they both need each other, and without each other, neither could exist. Um, that's what celebrities and press are. Press is never trying to like make a celebrity look bad unless we all agree. Everyone's just trying to make everyone look good. So when he said that, I was like, oh my God, it's so logical. Like, yeah, they would never use that. No one's yeah. like, it might resurface in like 10 years of like, look at this embarrassing moment on a red carpet, but it's not going to be now. And so I was able to relax and actually have fun, but it was the worst moment of my career. I think the uh, worst, I, honestly, it, the way wow. it felt in my body it was worse than fainting on stage. Yes, because happen? this the scale of this was larger. Yes, fainting on stage was no. probably the uh, no dancing with stars being eliminated first was the worst. Oh yeah, mm. um, and being said that I was awkward and that I'm not a good dancer and being laughed at oh, by Len Goodman. Rest in peace, you bastard. Um, actually, we'll talk more about this when we get back because we have to take a break. Okay, we're back. When did you faint on stage? In 2007, when I was uh, performing at Hennessy's in Dana Point, uh, it was like a, a restaurant, and I was on stage, and I hadn't eaten enough that day, and I smoked a little weed, 
and I um, ran before the show. That was also what was going on. I had not eaten enough. I had run uh, on a treadmill before. Like I just set myself up to be anxious. Yeah. And then the second I was doing well on stage too, and I just started blacking okay. out. And I had never blacked out before. And I go, I think I'm gonna faint because I, I my I wasn't I couldn't remember my jokes. Like my brain was failing me. And then it started getting tunnel vision, and I didn't know what was happening. But I just go, I think I'm gonna faint. And then I looked at the woman in the front row and I go, is that awkward? And she said, yes. <laughs> and I said, it is. is and that that's the last awkward? thing I said. I know. <laughs> well, it was before awkward was like a catchphrase. I have yeah. to say this was 2007. Awkward wasn't like, I just was like, is that, I don't know what, I, my brain wasn't working. I don't know if anyone here has ever fainted, but you aren't cognitively with it. No. Mm-hmm. You're not cognizant. And then she said, it is. She goes, yeah. And I, and I go, wow. it is? Brutal. Like, I question it like it is. And then when I fainted, I kept the microphone next to my mouth. And I was mumbling things on the way down. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. It was the most embarrassing moment of my life. And I came to... to I can't believe you've heard this. Dude, I fainted in front of a room of uh, probably 300 people. Wow. And it went dead silent. The MC came up and rescued me. I don't know exactly how it went down because I fainted, but I nearly fell off the stage because it was just a, a stage that was built up in the middle of this room. Yeah. Like there was no back to it. There was no wall. Oh, so I okay. almost fell off the back of this platform. That would have been bad. But these guys came up and, and caught me and I just f- kind of crumpled. And then I kept talking and mumbling in the microphone. Like, <laughs> and I had a dream while I was fainted that I fainted on stage. And I was like, and then I was also in the ocean, like rolling around in waves. Oh, and then I point. woke up from a dream. Yeah, I woke up from a dream that I had fainted on stage. And I've told this story before, but you know, when you wake up from a dream that's really bad, like a nightmare, and you go, oh my God, thank God. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm so glad that didn't happen. That's how I woke up. I go, oh, oh my God, that would have been the worst embarrassing thing ever. Thank God that was a dream. Oh my God, it wasn't. And I all of a sudden look around and I'm like, oh, this is real. And because I was so embarrassed, the anger came through like it did on the red carpet when I snapped at them and go, I'm not supposed to know a Kevin Hart movie or whatever I said. The anger came through and I stood up in adrenaline and I go and I ran. I ran out of the room. Right. And then I'm uh, and I went right to the bathroom. Final thought. So I fainted. I stood up. I ran. The room is dead quiet. Like I woke up because of the quiet. Right. I ran to the bathroom. I'm in the bathroom alone in the women's room and no one's coming in to like help me or check in on me, but I'm in the stall and I'm really thinking my career is over. My career has not even begun. This is 2007. I'm going to new faces very soon. This was planning to go to Montreal, new faces, big mm. opportunity. Rest in peace. Rest in peace as well. Len Goodman and new faces. Yes. All um, your, everything that embarrassed you is now going to hell. Mm, watch out. Hennessy's Hennessy's fell into the ocean. <laughs> 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 I think it's still around. I would love oh, to go is. back to the scene of this crime, but it was yeah. so. Someone's written to me. They heard me tell this on another podcast and was like, oh my God, I know T- Hennessy's in Dana Point. So I am in that stall and I'm just like, oh my God, like this is going to get out. It just felt, it felt the same way I felt in that Kevin Hart moment, actually, because I'm like, you dumb bitch. You didn't eat enough today. This is what I'm feeling when I fainted. You didn't eat enough. You're kind of anorexic right now, and you're not admitting it to yourself. It's a thing you're hiding from people. You, you're not telling people you're not eating, but you're trying to lose weight so you can have some sort of control when you're in Montreal because you know you're not funny enough to go. So you have to be thin because then that'll be some kind of achievement. I don't know what was going on in my head, but I felt like I had I had been doing sneaky things and I was busted. Like I fainted. I had been anorexic at that point for you know, five years and I had never fainted. And as an anorexic, you're constantly getting up and like losing kind of getting stars and like uh-huh. almost passing out. But then you catch yourself and you're like, okay, still got it. And I had, it, it just felt like a moment of such weakness. And what, what an idiot. You're an adult woman who's fainting on stage. And I felt <laughs> like, I don't know, I, you know, in that moment where you're not thinking rationally, you're like, my life is over. This yeah. is going to get out. People are going to find out. I don't. I can't even play out how it ever could have gone that way because who gives a fuck? Right. You know, even if I was famous and fainted, like who, everyone just that has compassion get, for someone who yeah, faints. Empathy. Like the person yeah. in the front row was totally wrong, and that's you. It was sent you into this headspace. You. It, it's not awkward to faint on stage. It's frightening, and it's uh, you have you. You're concerned about the awkward. It depends how you fall, I guess. If you like hit your head well, on I the asked. table. 
Yeah. It was probably awkward that I was asking. Well, she a- was just felt like <laughs> put on the spot. She did Or she, maybe she thought yes. it was a part of your act. Yeah. A lot of people did. They were like, was that a bit? And I'm like, why would that ever? I guess if I was like Kaufman esque, but like the, I would never do that. And not that anyone knew my style then. I was literally unknown. Um, but I was in that stall just <laughs> thinking, like, my life is over. This is going to get back up to LA. Yeah. They're going to kick me out of the festival. I'm a liability. I think that's where a lot of it comes oh, from. Shit. A lot of shame comes from like, you're a liability. And even on that red carpet, I'm like, oh, you dumb bitch. Like, you could have on the way over in the car, instead of talking to Curran about whatever fun thing you wanted to talk about, you could have said, hey, what's just some things I could talk about with the Kevin Hart thing? Can we go over some Kevin Hart movies? Like, I could have been, you know, practicing and getting ready yeah. but instead i was like hey what's been going on in your life and blah 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 and just wanting to have fun and it's like it i started beating up on myself for not doing enough hard work and for mm-hmm. like not eating enough and why did i go on the treadmill for an extra 10 minutes that probably depleted me in a way that i couldn't come up with a kevin hart movie to lie about uh why would i even lie why haven't i seen a kevin hart movie i'm a bad person kevin hart is a a, a national treasure what's wrong with me why do i why am i in entertainment if i've never seen a kevin hart movie why do i expect to be in movies if i haven't like all of these things oh boy wow. so i'm in that stall in 2007 though and i'm like it's over for me and then i was like so embarrassed that i got angry and i just ran out of the bathroom and to a room of people that is waiting for me to emerge from the bathroom trying to collect themselves figure out what's going on what's going on with the show no one's in the bathroom because there's no women on the show that are running the show to come check in on me they're all men so they're like there's no one coming in right Mm -hmm. so i'm probably in there for a minute i burst out of the the doors burst out onto this room of 300 people it's literally the bathroom's right next to the stage so they're all facing me and i go is anyone gonna and then oh and I look at them all just like ra- rabid, right? And then I beeline it right right into the kitchen, right off to the right. I see the kitchen doors and I bang through the double doors and I was like, give me a piece of bread. Like I just needed some kind of, <laughs> you know, obviously my blood sugar had failed. So I was like, I need some food. And they give me food and I'm then I'm embarrassed that I yelled because that was so not cool and it's no one's fault except my own. Mm. And then I'm in the kitchen hiding, trying not to ever have to go back out there. And I'm crying and I'm asking for my friend Taylor Williamson who was there. I was like, I need Taylor. Where's Taylor? And then he comes in. He's so shooken up. It was so embarrassing to see how scared he was. I felt I felt so bad. And then I oh, I eventually had to walk by out, out into the room to like leave. Oh, and like God. everyone started applauding. And that was made me oh. sick. I just Maybe was like, that's oh. why you don't want birthday speeches because it brings up that trauma. It's just too much attention and it's too sincere and it's like sweet and they were all happy I was alive. But so what yeah, was it your, kind of uh, was the same vibe. No, you're, it's a good connection. What was your exit strategy after that? Which is a uh, Kevin Hart movie. <laughs> <laughs> it is, right? That, yes. <laughs> so I, I just ate dinner because I had planned on... I was broke at the time, right? This is 2007. So when you would get these gigs, you would get to eat one meal at the place and you could get whatever you wanted. So I got this badass salad that was filled with stuff and I was so excited to eat it. But when I got there, they were like, can you go up first? And I was like, I really need to eat. I knew that I was suffering because I hadn't eaten all day. It was my one meal a day because I was really, you know, dieting. And um, and they go, don't, you can just eat. Your food will be ready as soon as you get off stage. And I go, yeah, okay, fine big mistake so i ate my food and then everyone was like she can't drive back on her own i'm like i swear to god i can i am fine and so it was a big fight with everyone to let me drive back on my own and they eventually did and then Mm -hmm. nothing happened i just went to montreal and bombed my face off and that brings us to my conclusion on kevin hart which is i bombed at montreal bombed for me it wasn't bombing but like at montreal you want to stand out and i just didn't i was below mediocre right and um and i was too thin and it was like i i didn't even look good i looked sick i had bags under my eyes i was uh, i had a crush on this guy and i kind of got too drunk and threw myself at him and got rejected and felt really embarrassed by that i was also on this the same dance floor where i threw myself at that guy while we were slow dancing um later on we were fast dancing and i slipped and fell and uh like sprained my wrist so i had like a I had to have my wrist bandaged, so I was like drunk and dry and hungry and not funny this entire special or this entire uh, time. And um, I was just, I just felt like such a fraud. Like, what are you doing here? And I was drinking too much. I was my life was just in shambles, right? And um, and my bones were so brittle. That's probably why it broke because I wasn't feeding myself. And um, 
But then I went to go see this comic that was the talk of the fest and he was having like, he was doing his first like big theater shows and he was the show to go see. There's always like for every year at Just for Laughs, there's like one guy who's like, this guy is taking over the world. He's the next big thing. Kevin Hart. I'd never heard of him. Went to go see him in 2007, which was confirmed later on by people at the party. I go, I saw Kevin Hart for the first time in 2007. They were like, that's the year he broke. That was the year that like, that was that summer. And I go, it was Montreal. They were like, that was the festival. That was the the moment. And I went to go see him and I had to leave because I was so depressed at how good he was and how young he was because he's not that much older than me. He's like, I think he's like 45. He's like six years older than me. That's crazy. Five years older than me. And he was just crushing in a way I could never even. Is he really? He's 44. Get the fuck out. He's 44. Yeah. He's been around for so long. He's so fucking good. And 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 so that was my whole story. Was like I uh, Kevin Hart. I the reason I can't watch him is because he's too good. And I spun it right. But that yeah. is actually if we're getting at the root of why I haven't seen Kevin Hart movies. Yes, they don't always appeal to me because they're like you know, uh, they're just like broad comedies that I'm not watch- even watching specific comedies. I don't really and and comedians don't really always like comedy. But he also is just too naturally talented, and it bugs me. Yeah, and um, and that was kind of the vibe of the night. Was everyone was just like, "You're just so naturally talented, and you believe in yourself too much." Mm-hmm. And we all don't, we don't, we don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love him a- in commercials. He's also great in commercials. Yeah, I mean, DraftKings is like kind of the only thing that I see him in. What commercial would I've seen him in? I don't watch commercials. Yeah, DraftKings is the one I'm thinking of right now. He, I love I him in seen, DraftKings. I just see it on like the Reddit one where it's a still image of him, and he looks good in that, and he's hilarious. He's in like but... Subway and State, State Farm sometimes. He's really? just in various. He just pops up in various places. What What was the best part about it for me, which I haven't seen someone else do at the Mark Twain Prize, is like heckle the people who are insulting him in a way that was so fucking on point. So someone would make a joke about Kevin Hart, and he'd go like, "Come on, Chelsea, come on!" Like he would, he would like come at her back at her in a way that was really fun and like the banter at it was so fun and there is a moment that happens at the mark twain prize keith robinson did something impromptu um keith robinson who who has had two strokes and had to walk out on stage with his cane and talk slower and is very hard to understand now um even though you know he he's he's, his mind is still sharp as fuck but he's just talking slower and he's uh, it's a little slurred and he has a cane and he's just slow but there is a moment with him that is one of the funniest things I will ever witness in my life. And you must watch it at some point when the Mark Twain Prize comes out on Netflix. It was not planned. And it was so hilarious. And then also there was another moment that Kevin Hart had later in the evening that just solidified how extraordinary he was. Because it was another unplanned moment that was just top notch. But there was it was it was savage. It was so good. And like, God, Chappelle. Chappelle goes Chappelle goes out and does this amazing monologue that has a point. It's poignant. It's funny. Oh, yeah. It has a beginning, middle, and end. It callbacks to things. And the guy doesn't even have notes in the prompter for it. Wow. He's probably riffing. He's... Uh, what the fuck, dude? Yeah, he he's is a just, genius. It, I was very curious to hear what they each had in the prompter. And some had the whole script and some had just bullet points. This is based on, you know, my connections with the oh, yeah. production team. I uh, I had to suck some dick to get these answers, you guys. But <laughs> For 10 years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, did Chris Rock have notes? He's like, get down on your knees. I'll tell you after. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, for 10 years, I've been doing this it's all to get the answers if Chris Rock has anything in the prompter when he gives a <laughs> speech about Kevin Hart. Um, but Chappelle had nothing. And Damn. that really... Uh, you know what that means, Brian. I mean, I think a lot of people do think comedians just riff, but that is extraordinary. Yeah. Extraordinary. He probably thought um, about it for a little while, but then oh, I yeah. bet you he went up there and riff. That's what he does. That's what he does well, on stage. That's what we were debating. Do you think he was backstage? Do you think he had a moment of like piecing it together in his head and kind of going over it? And I think without question he did. He this yeah. isn't he could do it off the dome without any problem, but I definitely don't think he's someone who doesn't prepare. He no. prepares in his own way. He just doesn't need to rely on notes. There was no moment moment everyone else which i would need this so much so there's no judgment every bril- the brilliance that was on that night like uh, i'm not speaking uh ill of their talent but they would say something sincere and turn to kevin hart and then they'd have to go back to the prompter to like finish what they were like to get back on track and have to like look down the barrel Chappelle was just all about kevin 
the whole thing was to Kevin. Wow. He wasn't worried about anyone else, even though he was giving a performance that was to the whole room. We all felt included. It just felt so sincere and down the barrel. And then Chappelle goes off and he's, you know, he goes to sit next to Seinfeld and Rock. And there's like a song playing because it's during commercial break or whatever. It's They're doing a, a change up. And the camera's on him and it's like, you know, we're all just like kind of waiting for the next thing to happen. And he's just like dancing and like not even dancing for like to be entertaining, but just like having a good time and not so self-aware. Yeah. And I just I just fucking love him so much. Yeah. And I know this is going to sound. I'm not even going to say what I was going to say, because I want I'm going to say to you off air and then you can I can, I'll, I'll say it on our next episode of mm. the Diamond Players Club. Yeah, uh, that is behind yeah. a paywall because I don't want to get canceled for what I'm going to say. But there's some he reminds me of someone um, so much and I don't want it to be uh, to come off the wrong way when I say it. So I'll say it to you off air. But um, Kevin Hart, <laughs> yeah, so our um, next uh, intrusive Chase, thoughts episode, Chase Freedom commercials. Those are the ones he's in that I couldn't think of. Uh, OK, yeah. yeah, well, he's I'm glad that you said that you had also never seen a Kevin Hart movie. I don't no, even know. Have you? Jumanji. I would have just said Jumanji instinctually because I know that he was in Jumanji. See, I forgot that he was in that because but I did didn't you even see pay Top attention. Five? That was Chris Rock's yes. movie that Kevin Hart <gasps> was in. Great movie. I did see Top Five. Yeah. That was so okay, so say that I know I on. have seen Kevin Hart movies because you can't miss them. But That's I really just a don't Chris remember. Rock movie, but Kevin Hart's in it. Yeah, that was a good movie. I actually yeah, really, really exactly. liked it. I should see that again. All right. Well, we. We uh, talked about something that I thought I was never going to talk about again. I literally thought it was the end of my career. And now I'm here. I am talking about it on my podcast. Um, thank yeah. you guys for listening. We will talk about our weekend of shows tomorrow on the show because we have uh, we were in Cincinnati. We were in Gary, Indiana. That was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Besties came out. I did a little ride out. along. What was that? I did a ride along. You did a ride along. That's from the Kevin oh, Hart movie. Oh, it's not for Kevin Hart. <laughs> ride along too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We will talk about that tomorrow. Thank you for listening. Dobika. Bye.